morning to Green Road Church. I hope you raised your hallelujah this morning. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to be here to bring praise and worship to you this morning and to worship in God's house. So welcome to God's house this morning. Uh, a couple announcements. Just keep highlighting the fall kickoff on September 8th, which starts our Wednesday night programming. will be from 538. There will be food and uh, drink and games and just things for families to do, so please mark your calendar to come for that night. Uh, midweek Supercharge, that's what our Wednesday nights are going to be called. Uh, we are excited this year. We're going to add some things. Um, as you see in your bulletin, a new adult Bible study, new adult study group, sorry, is going to be starting, and um, Doug and I have graciously said we will lead, so we hope you will plan on being, if your kids are coming, plan on coming to the adult study group that night as well. And I think uh, Orville and Roberta Burkholder, one more announcement, will be celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary 
and they have a special afternoon plan back in the fellowship hall after church with uh, treats and I do believe refreshments and lunch, right? Lunch, Roberta? They'll be doing lunch. So anybody that wants to come is welcome to come and celebrate that day too. Would you please rise? Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Psalm 100, 1 through 5. With all of my heart, I will praise you. I will praise you with all of my strength. With all of my strength, I will seek you. I will seek you all of my days. All of my days, I will follow. I will follow.
nothing better than to come into this house on a Sunday morning to sing praises to that one true God who listens, who hears, that we can just talk to. There is nothing better than that. We come together in the name of Christ to offer our praises and thanksgivings to hear and to receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of sins. That, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to, <laughs> as to the server of God. God has greeted us this morning. Let's greet one another. All right, we're going we're gonna to quiz time here. Well, maybe not. Do you remember during vacation Bible school, we talked about Jesus' power helps us to do hard things? Do you remember that? You remember old Cam and what was the other guy's name? Old Big Mac. No, it wasn't Big Mac. Was it Big Mac? Really? 
I don't even know what I called myself. <laughs> so, does he help you do hard things? Did he do your homework for you during the day? Last week? Take that test? Did you have a test at school? Did you? Did, did God do it for you? So it must not have been a hard test. <laughs> All righty. And I think Reverend Skydom is going to talk this morning. And, and, and as I read this, I thought, boy, this kind of went over my head too, because I got a really small brain up here. But he talks about goodness and knowledge and self-control and perseverance. You know what perseverance is? I should have got a Wikipedia answer for that one. Perseverance. What's perseverance? This kid's smarter than I am. Godliness. Brotherly kindness. Are you nice to your brother? Oh, that's right. You don't have a brother. You nice to your brother? <laughs> I'm not nice to mine either. <laughs> that's for all the things he did to me when I was younger. Um, where are we at here? Uh, what are other? Um, I think that's really about a lot of the words godliness, brotherly kindness, and, and brotherly kindness, love. Oh, you don't have a girlfriend, do you? Huh? Do you think your dad loves your mom? Do you love your mom? Do you love your dad? Yeah. So it's that feeling we get inside. So I think Gregor Skydom is going to talk about some of them words. I know I didn't get to see a sermon. He didn't let me proofread it or anything like that. But I think he's going to talk about it. And, and And them are the things that we, when things in life get hard, we got to turn these over and pray to God to help him, help us get through, you know, taking tests or got that big game coming up. How was the game on Saturday? Did you win? Did you? Huh. Not a boy. It's another Raider there. Okay. And a Red Hawk. You guys Red Hawks? No. You homeschooled? Are they homeschooled? Oh, okay. But, uh, no. No. When things are hard, you just turn them over to God, and hopefully he'll give you a good vision to get you through. Okay? Okay, you can go sit down. Thanks for coming, being here with me. Father, as I stand before you as this congregation um, bows their heads, quiets their hearts, and we give honor to you, for again, as Doug had said, for everything that you've given to us. The diversity of these gifts are all a commitment to honoring you. And we just thank you for that. Father, protect our minds, protect our hearts, protect our freedom to be able to come and worship, and especially protect these gifts that I bring to you, that we bring to you, use them, help us to use them for your honor and your glory and your kingdom. In your precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Love 
week and seen how massive those heavens are. We can't fathom that. And we can't fathom how much love he has for us on a day-to-day basis. Father, we just thank you for that. We thank you for loving us unconditionally of all the things that we might do wrong or we might say wrong. Thank you for that love. And it just reaches higher and higher and higher. We can't even fathom that. Father, we just thank you for that. Amen. As Reverend Skydama makes his way up this big long aisle up to the front here, you can get rid of me and I'll go back and sit down and do what I do best. Sit. Where he's going to read scripture from 2 Peter 1, 3 through 8. In your pew Bibles, it is page 1311. And if you would please, if you are able to rise and follow along with Reverend Skydema as he brings us the word. Thank you, sir, for coming in this morning and sharing. Got green light. I got it. There we go. We're in. All right. You're in now. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's read together, or I'll read, and let's listen together uh, from 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll begin at verse 3. These are the very words of God. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the very words of God and all God's people say, Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning to all of you. My name is Chad Skydema. Uh, I'm a minister in the Reformed Church in America, and currently I'm serving as the Regional Synod Executive of the Regional Synod of Mid-America. In the Christian Reformed Church system, you have your church and then your classes and then your synod. 
In our system, we have one level in between there, just above the classes, and that's where I serve in the executive role. And uh, I help uh, oversee churches in Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana. We have a few in Ohio, and we have a few in Iowa, and we have a number of churches in Florida. And uh, our churches in Florida is a place where God is just fanning flames like crazy. I have been so in awe of God's work in Florida, uh, and especially with the rising up of uh, the global south. And, and many of you may have heard that that is the next wave of Christianity coming out of places like Venezuela and coming out of places like Brazil and, and throughout all of Latin America. And uh, those people have come to the United States and they are planting churches at an alarming rate, something that shocks me. Uh, we have uh, just welcomed 50 new churches uh, into our classes in Florida uh, because God continues to do an amazing thing and, and bringing people to him and causing people to want to go to church and be a part of church. And it's just a, an amazing thing uh, for us to watch. And so we just, we just sit there and we want to watch for the sparks and see where God's working and follow him and work with him him in that. Uh, I've been here before. Uh, I pastored a church in Lafayette, Indiana for about 10 years. Uh, I, I started with the regional synod about seven years ago, but for uh, 10 years before that, I pastored a church in, in Lafayette, Indiana. And uh, at the invitation of Edie, uh, I came and led uh, a prayer retreat here uh, two consecutive years. And uh, so I'm a little bit familiar with your church, and I'm glad to be back here and, uh, and worship with you. Uh, I am married, have three sons, uh, Elijah's 18, Isaac is 16, and Aaron is 14, and uh, we just dropped Elijah off at Purdue University a couple weeks ago, and uh, I get to see him for the first time uh, today. Later today, we're going to drive down there and visit him, and for those of you who have sent kids to college, it's really weird when you have been involved in this kid's life for every day of it, and then he goes away and becomes his own person. It's, it's really an odd thing. So that's what we've been dealing with in our house in addition to football and, and all those other things uh, that my kids are involved in. Uh, so uh, it's, it's been fun, it's been busy, and uh, enjoying life. So, uh, I do want to dig into this scripture this morning. And one of the reasons uh, I think God led me to this scripture is, is I recently became familiar with a book called uh, Help, Thanks and Wow. Anybody familiar with that book, Help, Thanks, Wow? It's, uh, it's written by a Christian writer named Anne Lamott. And what she does is she distills prayer. All of prayer, she says, can be distilled into those three words, help, thanks, and wow. And I thought, she's right. Really, most of my prayers begin with help or thanks or wow. And I thought it's actually pretty reformed as well. I mean, if you think about guilt and grace and gratitude, uh, that's kind of the help, thanks, wow connection. We, we realize our sin and we ask for help from God. We, uh, we understand his grace and we accept it and we say thank you. And then we live in gratitude and say wow at what he has done in our life and in our world. And so as I was reminded of this help, thanks, wow idea, I thought, I need to journal about this. That's one of the ways that I pray. I don't always pray by journaling and writing it down, but one of the ways I do is by thinking of something and praying and writing it out to God. And so I thought, I'm going to have three different sections, and I'm going to have a help section and pray for that and write it down. I'm going to have a, a thanks section, write that down, and a wow section and write that down. And I did that for a few days, and when I looked back at what I was writing, I actually felt a little embarrassed that my help section was like this, and my wow section was like this. My thanks section, it was okay, but I thought, I'm sitting here praying so much for God to help me, and I don't spend near as much time thanking Him. And I don't spend hardly any time at all saying wow at what he's done for me. And so when I saw that, I started to feel kind of like a whiner. 
I mean, maybe that's my upbringing. Maybe, maybe you were raised differently, but the way I was raised is when you ask for help, it means you're admitting some kind of weakness. And we don't like to look weak. And so we don't ask for help. We think we can do it on our own. And in fact, some of us will fake it till we make it to try to show people that we don't need their help. But it just didn't sit right with me that all I seem to be doing is asking God for help. Now, we all need God's help. I'm not saying that at all. And for many of us, even despite the way that we were raised, it is okay to ask for help. For me, though, as I began to think of it differently, a different thought occurred to me that Chad is so selfish. All he's doing is asking God for help. He's not thinking about what God's done for him. He's not thinking about the amazing things God has done in this world. He's just asking for help for himself or help for someone that he cares about or help for something else. It made me feel a little needy. And it's one thing to be facing something you're unsure of. Absolutely, that is a time to ask God for help. It's something big, something out of your comfort zone. It's okay to ask for help, and you should be asking God for help in those situations. But it's another thing to have the bulk of your prayer life based on asking God for help. Your prayers help create your ideas about God. And if you're always asking for help, it can create this picture of God as this cosmic helper or this genie that you need to rub the right way with the certain words in order to get what you need. And asking mainly for help from God can keep us passive and maybe even inactive. Now, before I get into any sort of heresy like God helps those who help him, them, themselves, anybody know that that's not in the Bible? God helps those who help themselves. Before I get into that, I do want to dig into this passage of Scripture verse by verse, if you'll come with me into that. We go back to the beginning of it. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Notice Peter doesn't say His divine power will give us everything we need for a godly life. It says, has given us. Already done. Already given. It's yours through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. I mean, you know that, right? You were called by God's glory and his goodness. The best parts of God called you called you to be here this morning, called you to be his sons and his daughters, called you to have a relationship with him, called you to be his beloved. And because of that, because of God and who he is, not who we are, but who he is, we have already been given everything we need. And it doesn't just say we've been given some things. It says everything. We've already been given everything. Well, what is everything? What, what specifically have we been given? Well, if you keep reading in verse 4, it says, Through these, his goodness and glory, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Through his glory and goodness, God gave us his very great and precious promises. Promises to take away our sin. Promises of resurrection. Promises to prepare a place for us. Promises to never leave us or forsake us. God's promises are very great. They are very precious. And they are very sure. But they aren't just promises on the page in the Bible. Peter says the promises are given to us so that we may participate 
in the divine nature. Well, participating in the divine nature seems kind of nebulous and up there, and it could mean a lot of things. But the way I like to think about it is found in another prayer, a prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, in which he never asks for help, by the way. He says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And many of us have probably prayed that thousands of times in our lives. Most of the time when we pray it, we pray it as a congregation in unison. And the way you speak in unison is you say, thy kingdom come, pause. Thy will be done, pause, on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes because of that second pause, it's difficult to connect those two ideas. Because what Jesus is really praying is, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes we forget that God's desire for our earth is to make it more like heaven. God's desire for our earth is that it would have the same qualities as heaven. We are asking in that prayer, Jesus is asking in that prayer, that God would make earth look more like heaven. And that earth would be a place where things happen and it reminds people of what heaven will be like. Peter's saying the same thing as Jesus. When we participate in the divine nature, we are living in such a way that God's will is done here on earth just like it is in heaven. So that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. This doesn't mean we're going to escape all the bad things that happen in this life. We heard prayer, we heard prayer requests about it this morning. We've all lived through COVID over the last couple years. We know we're not all going to escape all the bad things that happen in this life. So there is corruption in this world. But Peter says we will escape it. And the way that we escape it is that that corruption isn't permanent on us. If you think about metal and rust, rust eats through metal. That's, that's corruption. That's corrosive. But for us, we may get touched by the evil in the world, but it cannot permanently affect us because we are in Christ. The permanent thing about us is that we are saved and given a place in God's family. Our salvation is sure and doesn't depend on us. It depends on God. And so we have everything we need to participate in making our little section of earth just like heaven. Prayers are not just words and pleas we hope God will answer. Prayer carries with it a sense of participation with God. Peter goes on, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection, anybody remember what? Love. These are the qualities you will find in heaven. Faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. Remember what the Apostle Paul says about love in 1 Corinthians? He says it's the ultimate. The greatest of these is love, Paul says. And Jesus prays that for his followers, that they may love one another. All these things, with the ultimate being love, enact these things on earth, is what Peter is saying. And if you have one of these aspects, if you're good at one of them, keep going and add more in an increasing measure, more and more and more until it gets to love, because love is the ultimate. Verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For me, asking for help all the time from God 
was just kind of lazy. And it was a way of me being unproductive in my prayers. I believe for me, it was making me ineffective because I was just asking for help without even really thinking about what I was asking for help for. I was asking for help without realizing that I need to participate in answering the prayers that I was praying to God. And I wonder how many of us just pray without really contemplating what we're praying about. Help me as I go into this meeting. Help me with this conversation. Help me face this thing I'm facing. Help me be a better husband, a better wife, a better parent. Help me help them fill in the blank. There's certainly a biblical precedent to pray for help. Absolutely. And based on many prayers throughout the Old Testament, people, people ask for help. People come to Jesus and they ask him for help. And the New Testament describes people of prayer who night and day ask for help from God. And Jesus says, I will send you the Holy Spirit who will be your helper. And it's interesting that we're asking God for help. And Jesus says, I'm going to send somebody to help you. So don't stop asking God for help. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But what I am saying is this. In meditating on this scripture, it has made me change the bulk of my prayers. And I would encourage you just to entertain this and think about it. Maybe try it on in your own prayer life. But I've changed from help me to awaken this inside of me. And awaken the courage inside me to have this hard conversation. Awaken the joy inside me to be happy and engage with people. Awaken the love inside me to want to help my brother or my sister or my neighbor. Awaken the gratitude that you've already given to me to live life in such a way that I'm at peace. Awaken me. And it's made me more intentional about what I've been praying for. Rather than just not knowing how something's going to get solved or done and saying, God, help me do this or help that. Or... I'm now much more intentional about what I'm praying for. And I think about what I actually need from God so that I can help answer my own prayer, so that I can work with him in answering the prayer that I've been asking for help in. I mean, you might ask God to activate that which is already in you, that which he's already given to you, that he's already provided. You might ask him to remind you that he's already given you everything you need to live a godly life. You might ask him to give you confidence in the gifts that he's given to you already. You might ask him to awaken the grace or the knowledge that he's already given to you. I mean, maybe we doubt that. Maybe we doubt that he's already given that to us. Maybe for some of us, that's why we ask for help. So maybe we need to ask him to erase those fears and doubts. Maybe we need to ask for confidence. And speaking of confidence, there are really two ways to gain confidence. One is with knowledge. You read a book about something and, and you can talk about it to someone else. Maybe... Uh, uh, you find some knowledge by watching a YouTube video and now you know how to change the tires on your car or the headlight or whatever it might be. We, we can gain knowledge or we can gain confidence by having more knowledge. Absolutely. And Peter says this too. He says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. That's an exhortation to all of God's people to read the Bible. 
Get to know God more and more by reading the Bible. Get to know who God says you are by reading the Bible. Gain more knowledge about God so that you can live in such a way that you know he's already given you everything you need. And the second way we can gain confidence is through experience. We try something. And if it works out well, we have confidence that we can do it the next time. Or if we take one step and we don't get knocked down, we have confidence that we can take another step in faith. And it's, it's true that transformation happens more by our experiences. So if you read the Bible, you will know lots about God. And, and you can be saved through those pages. There's great things that happen in those pages. But when you actually step out in faith for God, when you actually say, you know, hey, God wants us to be good neighbors, and so I'm going to actually help my neighbor in such a way, when you actually step out in faith and do those things, that has a huge power to transform us. And we get more confident in that way. And that's what Peter's talking about when he talks about participation. Participating in God's redemptive work here on earth and experiencing God working through us can give us a huge confidence and can remind us that God has already given us everything we need. And if we were to gain more confidence in God and God working through us, we might not feel like we have to ask for help so much. We might not feel so needy. And instead, we might ask God to use us to be an instrument of his grace. Now, it might just sound like semantics, that we're just playing with words here to change our prayers, to be more about awakening me than help me. But our words are important because what we say and how we pray leads to what we become and how we think about ourselves and especially God. If we're always asking for help without ever really even thinking about what we, how we can participate with God, it's harder to grow in confidence. It's harder to grow as a disciple. It's harder to step out in faith. Because brothers and sisters, God has indeed given us everything we need for a life lived with him. May you, may your family, may your church be reminded that God has given you everything you need. And may he awaken it in all of you in abundance. Lord God, give us a clarity in our minds. Give us your spirit working in us. That the words that we've read this morning and that I've said this morning will not return to you empty. That they will continue to marinate and roll around in our minds and make their way down into our heart and then out into our hands and our feet that we can change and live for you. I pray that you will use us to be instruments of your grace. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless us as we do it and that what we do and how we live for you as changed people will be a blessing to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise and join us for grace like that.
truth in his strength. There is nothing we can't do, yes we know. There are greater things in store, we will not be overtaken, we will not be overcome. Jesus from the grave, the same power that the master did to wake, is in us, is in us. The same power that the mountains when he speaks, the same power that they call a raging sea, is in Oh! 